Hello, this is George Ivana uh, from NARA Director of Policy and Program Development. We do want to give it just a couple of moments for a few more people to join us uh, due to the heavy volume of internet traffic. We're giving everyone just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to NARO's Washington, D.C. virtual convening uh, for today, March 31st, 2020. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's session. I am George Ivana, NARO's Director of Policy and Program Development. And again, I want to welcome everyone to this session. Um, today's session couldn't uh, be done without our sponsor, Yardi. So again, we want to thank Yardi for all the, the support they provide us and the ability to put on this webinar. Before we get too far in, I do want to touch on a couple of uh, technical pieces just to make sure we're all uh, going to do okay today. If you are having any technical difficulties, please email go to naro4 at naro.org. Again, go to naro4 at naro.org. And then I'll see that email and I'll try to help you get back into the webinar. Also, uh, we will take advantage of the chat feature in the GoToWebinar tool panel. Please go down to the word chat, the little arrow next to it, click on that, it'll drop down, and then you can type in your question or comment there for our panelists to review uh, during the session today. So we also will have a, ha a handout. The handout is uh, NARO's 2020 legislative and regulatory agenda. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of today's session, but that is in the handout section as well. Right now, I am honored to introduce um, NARO's president, Sunny Shaw, for a few welcoming comments. Sunny? Hello, NARO family. Uh, welcome to our second virtual convening of what would have been our DC conference. I am so excited to have you on this uh, webinar today. It's a big day for NARO. We have, from what I understand, about 300 meetings happening on the Hill for Advocacy Day. So I'm looking forward to hearing great things that have happened throughout this day. Although I miss seeing your faces, I'm very grateful that NARO has been able to find a way for us to be able to utilize technology and bring the important information to us in our homes, in our offices, that we would have been able to hear at this conference. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Todman, let her introduce our dignified guests and carry on with the webinar. Thank you all and have a fabulous day. Thank you very much, President Shah, and thank you for that very kind welcome from Idaho. I hope things are okay with you all out there. Um, it's a great honor to have our guest with us, Dr. Mark Calabria. Um, I have known uh, Dr. Calabria now for some years and really excited that he is continues to be a partner with us in the housing se sector, but in a slightly different way. Um, Dr. Calabria was sworn in as a director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency in April of 2019. Prior to that, he was the chief economist for Vice President Mike Pence and handled all economic policy issues with a focus on taxes, trade, manufacturing, financial services, labor, and of course, housing. Prior to his service with the vice president's office, he spent just about eight years at the Cato Institute as a director of financial regulation studies. Prior to that, 
he was a very senior aide in the U.S. Senate Committee's Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, which is where several of us got to know Dr. Calabria very well on the work he did on housing issues. He also served at HUD as a Deputy Assistant Secretary and did stints at Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies, the National Association of Home Builders, and the National Association of Realtors. He holds his PhD from George Mason University. Welcome, Dr. Calabria. Well, thank you, Adrian. I appreciate that, that very kind introduction. Excellent, excellent. Well deserved. Well, you certainly um, came to the job, job well prepared. Um, how has it been uh, for you so far? Well, the fact that it's almost been a year, I, I can certainly say it's been a busy year. It's been an exciting year, certainly not been boring. Uh, <laughs> we've had a number of a number of things to work on and, and perhaps it gets uh, less boring by the day. Uh, but I, I'm very proud of what I think we've accomplished in, in a year. I look forward to uh, what we'll be able to get done in the next four years, uh, the remainder of my term. Uh, and really happy that we've put in place a number of things over the last year, such as building capital and strengthening Fannie and Freddie. Uh, we're getting tested a little earlier than I expected. Uh, I know some people have heard me say that I thought we had two or three years before we hit a stressed environment in the housing market. And it seems that that actually hit a little bit quicker. Uh, which is why I think it's been so important what we've tried to build up over the last year. Great. Thank you so much, Director. Now, I will say that many of us are familiar with you and perhaps not as familiar with what your agency does. Can you describe a little bit about why FHFA was created and its core mission today? Absolutely. And, you know, that's, and that's a reasonable. The, the agency was only created in 2008, so as far as agencies go, it's still relatively new. Uh, it was the merger of the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight and the Federal Housing Finance Board. Uh, in these agencies, the FAO uh, regulated Fannie and Freddie, the Finance Board regulated the 11, and then 12, but now 11 federal home loan banks. And so our primary purpose was really created in the midst of the financial crisis to try to make sure that we had stability in our mortgage market uh, and so that we would never have a recurrence of the events that, that led to 2008 and led to, as we know, tremendous amount of foreclosures and stress uh, and hardship among many families and communities. So really the bottom line reason uh, that my agency was created was to try to bring some stability, some safety and soundness to our secondary mortgage market. Uh, and that is really what we're focused on every day. Right. So before we jump into um, some of your mission objectives, let's let's talk a lot about um, what's on the top of everybody's mind, unfortunately, these days, which is COVID-19. Um, I know that your agency took some action just about a week ago related to mortgages. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you did and the impact you hope it has? Absolutely. Let me separate uh, 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 impacted parties into maybe three different categories. And we've really tried to focus on this uh, from a public health perspective. Um, we don't want to, uh, we want to minimize hardship. We know there are lots of families losing jobs, losing income. So let me take the first category. Um, there are a number of uh, households, of course, that have been impacted directly or indirectly by the virus, and not simply that you or your family may become take ill, but also because you've lost your job. You know, we've seen this particularly in retail services, where a number of companies have shut down, a number of people have lost their jobs. And so for those categories, what we have set in place is a forbearance program. It's important to keep in mind, it is forbearance, uh, it, which means there's a pause on the mortgage, whatever is missed will have to be paid back the way we're setting this up is let's say for instance we're in this for another three months borrow misses three months of the mortgage what we want to do is extend you the term of the mortgage by three months so there's not any payment shock but there's some certainty but again the expectation is the borrower pays it back really do want to emphasize when you're talking to people who are interested in this this is really targeted at individuals who had suffered an economic hardship and a loss of job, loss of income. We think it's so important for triage purposes that if you're not impacted, don't apply for it because we're really trying to put the resources and the attention on those who have been impacted. Uh, and I think that's just so critical. You know, if you haven't lost your job, the expectation is that you'll continue to be able to pay your mortgage. But that's the first category of borrowers. Second category of borrowers is uh, unfortunately, a large number of households were facing foreclosure even before the virus. 
Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we weren't putting those families out of their homes, potentially uh, exposing them. We're all trying to shelter in place in this environment. And of course, nor did we want to put local sheriffs and such and uh, anybody in into the house and being exposed. So there has been uh, a foreclosure eviction moratorium. Uh, and once we're through this crisis, that will come back into place. But we really wanted to tell households, you know, even many who had been in the home for a number of years, uh, beyond the mortgage being delinquent, that you, nobody will be put out on the street because of this. And the last category, and again, we don't, before I talk about renters a little more in depth, is to remember our agency regulates Fannie and Freddie and the federal home loan banks, and the way we are able to touch uh, homeowners and renters is through the mortgage. So the renter program has been a little bit more complicated solely because we have to work through the landlord. And so what we have set up is if there is a problem with the renter paying the rent, that renter can go to the landlord and say, I can't make rent for this month or however many months. And then the landlord has the option of coming to Fannie and Freddie and saying, you know, I can't pay the mortgage during this time because I'm not receiving the rent. And then what will be done is the landlord is given forbearance, just like on the homeowner side, the landlord will have to pay it back at the end. And the landlord is required during that forbearance time not to evict. So again, we want to make sure that there are no evictions in that case. And unfortunately, just the way the structure of the system is where the Fannie Freddie mortgage relationship is with the landlord, we have to work through the landlord. Uh, and again, the tenant has to go to the landlord and get the participation of the landlord. But for those landlords who are willing to give their renters a break, we're willing to give those landlords a break. Great. I, I, I know that a week ago when you made that announcement, I could hear a sigh of relief across the country. So, the, you know, it's it's uh, leadership matters doing uh, doing situations like this. So we thank you. I, I just wonder, do you do you see do you do you see any concerns um, about moratorium on uh, evictions and foreclosures downstream uh, with the landlords and owners? Do, do you see um, folks um, having any concerns on on when their payments are due, say, to their mortgages or mortgage services? I, I think there will be. You know, obviously, we're all trying to figure out how long this is going to last. And I think if we go beyond a couple of months, I think that there will be some real concerns about about the sustainability of this, about willingness to participate. I've certainly heard numerous examples of landlords saying that, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about this month. Uh, and I do think there, especially as we know, a lot of landlords are, um, have a few properties and obviously they're bigger landlords have lots of properties, obviously for public housing authorities, for the tenants, you know, even if you can give a few relief, uh, over time, that's going to become much more difficult. Uh, and again, we'll be able to continue forbearance for as long as necessary. We're certainly hoping that this is an event that doesn't go on more than two or three months. But I think if it goes beyond that, there's really going to be a lot of stress on the system. Uh, let me also say that while Fannie and Freddie represent just under half of homeowners' mortgages and just a little bit less uh, in terms of multifamily mortgages, We've been very delighted to see FHA mirror a lot of what we're doing, particularly on the homeowner side. You've also seen this among a number of the bigger banks, um, so many of the financial institutions. So while we may only have a little less than half of the market, we've seen a number, basically a little more than 90% of the market follow what we're doing. So we are still trying to make sure that all the rules are comparable. We want to make sure that every borrower has a very similar certain expectation and experience regardless of who holds their mortgage. Um, but I do, I will certainly emphasize that this is an event that goes on more than two or three months. You know, we will need a bigger set of solutions. Yeah, I, well, we certainly hope that this does not go on uh, beyond the time frame that you just outlined, Director, um, for many, many reasons. Do you, does, mm -hmm. FHF, does FHFA have any other COVID-19 response plans in the works? So we are also working on a number of things to try to keep the mortgage market functioning. So, you know, obviously a lot of borrowers want to be able to take advantage of the low rates. Uh, we've had some streamlining of refinancing, had some streamlining in the purchase side. It's certainly forcing an entire rethink because even when we get through this, I think the reality is going to be that there's certainly going to be hesitancy. Um, you know, you think about, you know, often for a, re for a uh, refinance or even a purchase of a home, there's an appraiser, a home inspector. 
And if you really think about the process, there's just so much face-to-face -face interaction in the real estate process. And so we are trying to figure out ways to streamline that because again, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic and we've looked at a lot of the epidemiological research and, and certainly I don't pretend to be an expert in that, but there's a lot of good reason to think that we'll be through this in two, three months. But even when we are, I think there'll be such a hesitancy to just go back to normal. And so we are looking at things that we can do in the mortgage process that reduce the necessity for face-to-face -face interaction. Excellent. Thank you for that. Now, let's pivot to FHFA's uh, core mission a little bit, as you, you outlined. So how would you describe Fannie and Freddie's uh, health today, you know, compared to, say, uh, 10 years ago? Well, I wish they were stronger today. Uh, maybe I'll first start with the comparison. When I walked in the door uh, almost a year ago, Annie and Freddie were leveraged 1,000 to 1, uh, so essentially guaranteed to fail. Today, they're leveraged about 240 to 1, uh, still way too much leverage, not enough financial health. To put that in perspective, on the eve of the crisis over a decade ago, they were leveraged about 60, 65 to 1. So still way too much leverage. We continue to build up health. There are a number of um, loan characteristics that are better. There are some that are worse. Uh, certainly we're in a better environment and that one of the benefits today is that while we are being hit with a tremendous amount of increase in unemployment because of COVID-19, fortunately as of now, most homeowners still have considerable equity. They have a desire to stay. So there's a lot of foundations of the housing market that are stronger, but again, still some real concerns there. But I would be the, the first to emphasize Fannie and Freddie are not as strong as they need to be. And in fact, you know, if this uh, if the virus event goes on more than two or three months, uh, we may be looking at another rescue for Fannie and Freddie. And we're hoping to avoid that. Uh, and I think we can avoid that. But again, if this goes on, that becomes more probable. Yeah, no, wow. Uh, you know, we, we're making so much progress. I, I certainly hope we don't take those step backwards. How how would you say the the onset of the pandemic has impacted the, the time frame that you wanted to get Fannie and Freddie out of conservatorship? It's had some modest delays, but, you know, I would really emphasize, you know, we're engaging in rulemaking. Uh, we've been expanding at FHFA. There are a number of things we need to do to, to beef up our supervision staff. Um, we've got some rule makings going on. We'll be doing a capital rule that's been delayed probably about another month because of this, because A, we really want to make sure that when we put a regulation out of rule that we have an opportunity for the public to comment, you know, for us to have round tables, uh, you know, and again, because of the social distancing, so much of that interaction, you know, for instance, all of my staff are in mandatory telework. So the ability to come in and have meetings, you know, we're all doing things, uh, conference calls. And so again, trying to get the rulemaking process back up and started and done in a transparent way where the public can, can interact, I think will take a little bit of work. But on the bigger picture, one of the requirements for Fiat and Freddie to get out was a likely need to do a very large public offering, a raise of capital. Uh, in my sense was they were never really gonna be able to do that before 2021 anyhow. So I think at the end of the day, we're still looking at a late 2021, 2022 um, capital raise in beginning of an exit of conservatorship for Fiannie and Freddie. So that timeline has not slipped much. Excellent. That's good to hear. Um, so I know that many of our members, and I know that you know many of our members, have relied on the RAD program to preserve their public housing and to convert from the public housing program to a Section 8 platform. And they've benefited a great deal from Fannie and Freddie's duty to serve. Is it is it your sense that the GSEs are, are fulfilling their plans related to their duty to serve plans? You know, by and large, yes. You know, let me really emphasize, and, and you, you talked about earlier my experience on the banking committee, and, and I was there and one of the staffers who helped create the agency and create the duty to serve. So it's been interesting to see how that develop as we've seen that in legislation. And I want to make a couple of uh, broad points. First, the duty to serve was meant to be very different than the housing goals. So it really was meant to be more qualitative, while the housing goals are meant to be more quantitative. And of course, there was a statutory recognition of the rental assistance demonstration program, which we think, which I think is an important transition to, to help bring sustainability, you know, to the public housing world. And so 
the duty to serve really is an obligation on Fannie and Freddie. They put forward plans. We at FHFA approve the plans, and then we judge uh, whether they actually meet the plans. And so by and large, they've been able to do that. They've really increased their participation in RAD. Uh, they've really been, and we also, I should note, we redid the caps on the multifamily lending last year and increased the percentage of the of multifamily lending footprint that Fannie and Freddie should do so that they will be more focused on the affordable. Uh, we are in the midst, and again, partly because of the, the COVID-19, because we can't really do much of a rulemaking, um, we will likely revisit the duty to serve uh, rule next year and try to make sure we're doing this in a more open process and hear from people what's worked, what hasn't worked, uh, and we'll later this year be revisiting the housing goals. But again, really wanted to do this in a transparent manner and make sure that they're having an impact and really hear from people. Uh, I suspect maybe some of your members participated. We did roundtables uh, last year in, in California, uh, Washington. I believe we did one in Kansas City. So we hit a number of cities where we wanted to make sure we've had public input on the duty to serve process. Yeah, yeah, no, we our our members are definitely staying close to how the affordable housing goals of uh, the GSEs will be shifted. We and we noted that some months ago, when the administration released its housing reform plans, there was a, a big uproar that the affordable housing goals were going to be removed, and and there was a lot of concern there. I I know that you and I have chatted previously about this, but tell me a little bit more about the concern that the affordability goals will be removed from Fannie and Freddie's performance. Sure, let's let's start with a couple of qualifiers. I'll, re, I'll, I'll remind everybody we are an independent regulator, so we're not we we were not part of the administration's plan. We did not draft that. Um, the housing goals are in statute. We intend to carry that out. They come up for renewal this year because they're done every few years. Uh, we're at the beginning of a process of implementing those and making sure that they are effective and making sure they're making a difference. But I really do want to emphasize uh, only Congress can get rid of the goals. It really doesn't look like there's any you know, any drive to do that right now. Uh, I do think, again, while I can't speak for the administration since we are an independent regulator, I think there was a real question uh, on the part of the administration whether the goals were the most efficient and effective way to deliver um, housing assistance and housing subsidies. And quite frankly, I, I'm, I'm of the mindset that it's always important and it's always reasonable to ask whether government programs have been effective or not. You know, and I would make the broader observation that uh, the goals were first implemented in the 1992 Act and, of course, uh, HUD before that had some affordable mandates. For a number of years, the goals were not even very binding. It was very easy for the GSEs to meet them. But if you look at where the home ownership rate for low-income households was when the goals were created, it's still about there now. So I, I do think there's a broader question. And one of the things that we will be looking at within the context of the goals, because again, I want to emphasize the goals aren't going away, is historically the goals have been met by essentially, you know, discount in price, slightly lower guarantee fees, slightly guaranteed rate. You know, and my philosophy is that the goals are not simply about giving discounts, they're about making loans that would not have been made otherwise. The way I've characterized it to the GSEs is I, I think it's more important to burn shoe leather than to burn, burn basis points. How do we know that the goals are resulting in loans being made that simply weren't going to be made otherwise? Uh, and I think the evidence is certainly for the first decade of the goals, they were largely making the loans they were going to make anyhow. Uh, so again, want to make sure that the loans are actually pushing the GSEs, but pushing them to be responsible. We saw before the crisis, for instance, in the mid-2000s, where Fiannie and Freddie would often purchase subprime private label mortgage-backed securities, and those would count for the goals. Of course, that's no longer the case. So again, going forward, we will be doing a rulemaking this year. We want to hear from the public, want to be transparent about it, but we want to make sure, A, how do we make sure the goals are effective in expanding credit beyond what would happen otherwise, and how do we make sure that's being done in a responsible manner? Very good. And I see some questions are coming in. I encourage you to continue to send questions in as I continue my 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 chat with the director. Let's let's talk about something that seems like a lifetime away. Remember the presidential election and the campaign? Yeah. Is there, is there <laughs> one of those going on? I know. <laughs> you wouldn't know. <laughs> you, you wouldn't know anymore. I know. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, housing affordability has certainly come a long way as it relates to um, um, being at the forefront of the, of the candidates' um, um, 
uh, platform. We, we saw all of the major candidates produce a housing plan, which I know at NAR we were thrilled to see. We were thrilled to see many of them also include provisions for the voucher program and the public housing program and many of the programs we care about. One program that received a lot of attention is the Housing Trust Fund. And um, I don't know that some of our members are aware of the role that um, your agency plays with the Housing Trust Fund. Can you explain that to us? Absolutely. And so let me preface, while, while of course we're an independent agency and we, we do our absolute best to keep out of politics, you know, we are facing an affordability crisis in many parts of this country. And, and I think it's made the impact of the, of the virus that much more difficult, the inability to find housing. Um, you know, I have my own views, which we can go into why we're facing an affordability crisis, but I think it's so important that we're having a broader conversation uh, about that. Ian, so that said, so, you know, we'll not reflect on it, what any one candidate has said or not said, but the, under the legislation created in 2008, which again, I, I had the privilege to be able there and work on, we had two funds that were created. One is the uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and then there's the Capital Magnet Fund. These are both funds, and I guess before I talk about the details, I, I will note we just recently, a couple of weeks ago, sent the largest allocations ever uh, from the GSEs under these funds, and they're both created by assessments, essentially, on the activities of Fannie and Freddie. The trust fund is an allocation that's made from Fannie and Freddie to HUD, and HUD administers that, and then the capital magnet fund is administered by the CDFI fund at the Treasury Department. Uh, and again, those are important vehicles that have been able to provide uh, different vehicles for affordable housing. And again, these were created in the 2008 legislation. Uh, and again, they they, they depend on the, oper the successful operation of Fannie and Freddie. Yeah, I know that many of our, our members are very interested in seeing the, the housing trust fund not just grow, but that they are able to receive more access uh, to, to, to helping it with some of their capital leveraging. I'm going to move on to a question that I see one of our attendees has asked, and here is the question. Do you, do you see a role played by the federal home loan bank system during the pandemic crisis? And, and if so, what, what do you think that role may be? So they absolutely are playing a role. The primary activities from the federal home loan bank since their creation uh, in 1933 has been provide liquidity to their members. And so their members tend to be depositories, banks, insurance companies, some CDFIs. And so, for instance, one of the things that we've seen since the beginning uh, of, of March is the advanced activity by the federal home banks has increased by almost a third. So they're actually out there providing liquidity to the institutions that they're supposed to be doing uh, and really providing that in an important way, which is a core part of their business. Uh, and I think partly because, you know, they don't interact directly with the public that that's missed a little bit, but certainly the federal home loan bank membership, I know, has been able to access that liquidity. And of course, if you're a depository, if you're CDFI, and you're able to access those advances, you're able to continue lending and supporting your members and your clients, your borrowers. And so again, we've really seen that. Uh, of course, the federal home loan banks also have an affordable housing program that they every year contribute to, uh, and that continues to be able to provide important affordability in, in their districts and their jurisdictions. So by and large, they're, they're doing the role that they were meant to do, and, and I'm glad to be able to see them. We've spent a lot of time over the last year making sure they had, were, were in the health they needed to be, which really brings me to a broader point. Um, the 13 entities I regulate, again, the 11 federal home banks, Fannie and, and Fannie and Freddie, all have the very unique role that they're meant to be a floor under the system in a time of stress and a time of crisis. Uh, and I've been very happy to see the federal home loan banks play that role in the way they were meant to play it over the last month and the, the last couple of weeks. Fannie and Freddie have been able to do that to some extent. Uh, we continue to try to make them stronger so that they can they can even be a, a more important source of strength in the marketplace. So, Director, I, I know that you are, are a practitioner, but um, I will say, now let's put on your academic hat for a second. Um, there's oh, been, yeah. <laughs> you can do it, you can, you got it. Sure. Um, I, you, <laughs> You know, there, there's been a lot of interplay between some of the monetary policy and fiscal policy. We're seeing the, the United States government from an economic standpoint um, flexing a lot of its muscle from, from both standpoints. Is it enough? Do, do you think that we still have more room of support to grow both from a monetary side and, and from a fiscal side? 
So let me make a couple couple of comments. Um, a, first, I think we all have to remember that the primary objective here is a public health concern. So, you know, let's take the instance of people who work in the restaurant industry and the restaurants have closed in their home. Well, the solution is that not that we're trying to create some stimulus to make you go out and eat dinner out. We want you to actually stay home. Uh, of course, it'd be great if you order takeout from your usual place and try to support those businesses otherwise. But it is important to keep in mind that there are parts of our economy that we are intentionally shutting down. And that's appropriate and that's needed to be able to practice uh, social distancing to be able to achieve our public health goals. And so to me, we want to be careful that, you know, we're not trying to stimulate those segments of the economy right now. Uh, and really, that's why my view is that what Congress recently passed, I don't really think it's as much of a stimulus act as it is a relief act. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to be able to address is that families are experiencing hardships, interruptions in income, job loss, in rather than the normal recession where you immediately are trying to put people back to work. And of course, you know, if there are things that we can get people to do and transfer them to do, um, you know, for instance, I know talking to the, the mortgage lenders, many of them are hiring and trying to staff up to deal with the forbearance that's coming in in terms of dealing with mortgages. So there are parts of the economy that are hiring, but certainly it's far smaller than the job losses we're seeing. And so I think the short term emphasis has to be on, you know, how do we accept and appropriately target which segments of the economy will need to have to shut down? in the short run so that we can deal with the public health issues. And then how do we make sure that those, uh, those segments pop back? And of course, how do we make sure that families uh, have a floor underneath them during that transition, during that time of stress? And of course, the bigger question for all this is, I don't think we'll, need, we'll know what enough is until we have a better sense of how long this is gonna go on. Now you used to work on the Hill. What do you, what do you think the conversations are uh, like right now with the, the staffers up there looking looking to what might be a fourth relief bill? That's a good question. And I think you also have to keep in mind the stress. I mean, we've had a number of House members and senators who have tested positive. We've had staffers who have tested positive. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, you know, for me, one of the things that it immediately brings to mind in terms of memories is uh, I, I had the misfortune to be on the fifth floor of Hart one day when they found anthrax on that floor, except for <laughs> Senator Daschle's office at the time. And so some of this is bringing back the memories of um, spending weeks, whether or not I'd, I'd contracted anthrax poisoning or not. So I, I know there's a lot of um, really personal concern. And this is kind of how we've been. This is one reason why we were very early on as an agency going to mandatory telework. We very supportive Fannie and Freddie. All the federal home banks are doing mandatory telework. Um, we're trying to make sure that how do we have our staff? And I know this is what a lot of public housing authorities are struggling with too. And I just think it's so important that for all of us, you know, making sure our staff, their families, our communities feel safe and comfortable to me is the first priority. Um, and we want to be able to support, you know, all those, or all those organizations in that sense. Um, and so beyond that, I do think there's a sense of, you know, what will be the longer term needs? Uh, certainly, there are going to be a lot of things thrown out there. You know, my view is I do think we need to make sure that everything we do is targeted. Um, you know, we we received inquiries from the Hill and otherwise about the things that we wanted in the last package. And, and we tried to be, my, my approach was, I'm not here to ask for things that are unrelated to the crisis at hand. And so I do hope that Washington on the Hill focuses on, you know, this is this is not the opportunity to remake segments of the economy. This is an opportunity to say, how do we deal with the immediate hardship that people are facing? And, and again, I think the real question to me is, if this goes on for another six, eight weeks, then my expectation is, for instance, that many of the people who have lost their jobs, overwhelming majority of them will be recalled to their previous employers. But if this goes on for five, six months or more, you're really going to start to see, you know, longer term disruption that will take different solutions. So I'd like to say I know what the answer is, but I, I simply think it's it's too soon. And when we have a sense of how long this goes on, I think we'll have a better sense of what we need beyond the status quo. Yeah, I, I think one of the when I'm watching the news and and just paying attention to what what folks are concerned about, there is this sense that 
um, there's going to be a lot of money flooded into the system on the other side of the pandemic, during the pandemic, actually, rather. And there's a concern that that money won't make it to Main Street. And, and that That's those investments... very reasonable. Yep, those investments won't but make no, it no. to mom and pop. So how, how, how do we make sure that that happens? How do we make sure that some of the, even some of the interventions that you're taking is really benefiting the families that might need it the most? Sure, and, and that's one reason why we've really tried to, to express publicly, I mean, you know, because I'm an independent regulator and, and, and I don't have to worry about running for office, I think it's easier for me to get out and say for it. It's easier for me to get out and say, listen, if, if you don't need assistance, don't call. Right. If you know, if you can't pay your mortgage, do pay your mortgage. And and this is not, you know, you really are seeing call centers flooded. When the lenders I've talked to tell me that, you know, 70, 80 percent of the calls they're getting are not people facing an immediate hardship, but people who just want to know what their options are. And again, that's absolutely reasonable. We all want to know what our options are. You know, but the lenders are telling me, you know, they're about a week away from a digital solution. We can go online and figure that out. And so because I think it's so important, you know, in the financial system, in the housing system, we're going to have to be practicing our own version of triage. And I do want to make sure, so for instance, you know, when you're talking to people about their mortgage or their rent, if you can pay it, please pay it. Right. If you can't, because again, if you can do that, then you step out of the way and we're able to get the system focused on those who can't pay. If you just want to know what your options are, please wait till after the first week or so, because again, the beginning of the month later this week will be when the first mortgage payments are made or not made. And so we need to be able to focus on that. So if it's simply a matter of you want to know what your options are, please wait till, please wait till at least next week. Right. And so again, there'll have to be a focus on how do we target these resources. And of course, as you know, better than I, Adrian, uh, targeting has been a perennial long, you know, decades long discussion in housing you know, and who do we focus on? And of course, as we know, homeless populations, for instance, are, are even more vulnerable in this. And, and that's why you saw uh, a very large uh, ES, ESG appropriations. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I've certainly said to when I've gotten calls from, from members on the Hill, and they've said, well, where should we focus? And I've always said, why I, there is a, certainly there's an interest in the mortgage side, but the, the primary impact of this housing wise is going to be on hourly workers in the service retail sector who are primarily renters. That's why so yeah, we, whether it's we couldn't so, agree more. Yeah. So I, I do hope that that's where the focus is. You know, again, it's a little different business wise where you may want to focus on, you know, what industries do you want to make sure come out of this on the other side and, and are able to continue in that way. So I, you know, I, honestly, I've been very heartened to the willingness of people to really pull together. Um, you know, I, I, in, in that that was record time, I believe it was what a ninety-six to zero vote in the Senate. You don't quite get things like that too often. You sure, you sure don't. You, well, we, we've proven it can happen. Unfortunately, it took a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it's, but but I think it's important. I mean, members have gone back, and and I know that they're trying to practice social distancing while at the same time hearing from their constituents, and so you know they are taking calls, and so. You know, people want to figure out what the needs are, but you know, I think that the, the reality is until we have a better sense of, you know, of yeah. what the what the bell, how long this bell curve looks like till we look like we're on the downward slope of it, um, it's really kind of we, we all have a hard time planning beyond that. I know that's true for for all the public house for all of your members as well. Yeah, and no, we're we're thrilled that um, some of the congressional staffers and members. Um, have taken time out of their day today to have scheduled conference calls with, with our members. So I, I do know that folks really care about this no matter where they are. So, so thank you for that insight. Georgie, um, the, our, our minutes are ticking away. Can you remind our attendees on how to ask a question as we look at our last remaining minutes with the director? Absolutely. Um, please go to the chat box, the chat feature, and go to webinar in the toolbar there, usually towards the bottom. There's a little arrow next to the word chat. Click on that, and you can type in your question or comment right there. If you have just a few more moments, please go ahead and enter your questions now. Thank you. Okay. So, Director, just a couple, couple more questions, and uh, we'll, we'll free you to the hard work that I know you're doing. The Capital Magnet Fund, just to go in a completely different di direction right now, the Capital Magnet Fund, again, um, something that I know our members have heard of, um, may not know how to um, tap into it, and who even are beneficiaries of the Capital Magnet Fund. Can you describe that to us? 
Absolutely, and, and and I'll preface this with the remind you the capital magnet fund. So we, the Fannie and Freddie transfer that allocation to tre to the Treasury Department in Treasury's off CDFI Community Development Financial Institutions Office, which does the CDFI grants, is the one that runs that does the com competitive competitive grants. And certainly, while historically much of that has gone to CDFI. You know, public housing authorities, in my opinion, are likely to be eligible and can apply. And you really want to reach out to the CDFI office at Treasury to ask them what that process would be. Okay, thank you. And I know that we're really focused on um, uh, families who have mortgages, and, and you mentioned some of the relief uh, through through owners that renters will receive. Many of my members tap into Fannie and Freddie because of the work they do on the multifamily side. Um, do you think that there's any chance that Fannie and Freddie may raise their loan limits to to ease the market supply of financing on the multifamily side? Are you are you talking the multifamily lending caps? Yes. Or the, uh, okay. Okay. Well, so we're still trying to see what that's going to be this year. Um, so, you know, we are judging those as the year goes around. Those are year wide. We're still early in the year and it's done on an annual basis. So uh, what I would say is we will see uh, if it's necessary as the year goes by. Excellent. And so, you know, I'll ask you one last question, Director. You you are you have been a, 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 a strong housing steward all these years. I know you're very familiar with the roles that public housing authorities play. As as I have members talking to congressional staff today, how best can housing authorities, in your opinion, having been a Hill staffer and where you are now, how best can housing authorities really advocate for the work that they do? I think really such a crucial role that housing authorities can play is, is a bridge between what's going locally. You know, I'm, I'm the first to say, and I think many of us in Washington would admit we live in a bit of a bubble called Washington, D.C. Uh, and even I think the most um, diligent offices on the Hill are still a little divorced. I mean, yes, members go back and forth to the districts and you have, but you also keep in mind, there's district staff, there's Washington staff. And it's actually, you know, while many of the Washington staff may have come from the district, the reality is most Washington Hill staffers don't go back to the districts very often. And so their perceptions are going to be Washington. Um, so to the extent that uh, your housing market looks like Washington, D.C.'s housing market, you don't need to explain it much because the staff have dealt with that personally. But the broader point of kind of bringing in what's going on at the local level, particularly because so much of the housing problems are a combination of supply constraints at the local level. And I do think that what people on the Hill want to hear is, there's the expectation, understanding that this is a state-local partnership. So, uh, A, I think if you want to come in and make a convincing case for why the federal government should help you address the affordability issues in your jurisdiction, I think the beginning of the conversation has to be what's the local jurisdiction, whether it's the mayor's office, the governor's office, the housing authority, what's being done there to be a helpful partner to deal with those issues on the ground. Because as we do know, so much of the, the difficulty in many states, in many localities, in terms of housing supply is getting through the land use process, getting to the entitlement process, getting to the permitting process. And again, I think what people at the federal level want to hear is, okay, we're willing to be partners. How are you going to be a partnership in this in terms of telling us what's going on in locality? How are you being a voice for uh, smart housing reform at the local level? Because quite frankly, I don't think all of this can be fixed at the federal level. It's got to be done in partnership. Uh, agreed. I think that is a local problem, a, a state problem, and a federal problem all uh, locked into one, but lots of opportunities out there. Director, thank you so much for your time with us today. Is there any last thoughts you'd like to leave us? Well, I, I really appreciate the time. And what I would say is, you know, I think the next week or the next two weeks will really give us a good indication. We'll see, you know, how many households have trouble making rent, mortgage beginning of April. We'll start to see the additional unemployment numbers, and I think we'll have a much better sense of what the short-term issues are. But, but again, I, I think it really does reinforce the message that you know, being able to shelter in place is, is a luxury that many of us have, and a reminder that that's a luxury that many others do not. Uh, and it is a reminder that, to me, this is, of course, foremost a public health crisis. But at the end of the day, it really reminds many of us working in this field that housing is fundamental to public health. 
Thank you so much, Director. And I'm hoping that we will be able to do this again, but in person. I know that our NARO audience looks forward to that. Thank you. Absolutely. And Georgie Banna, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Lots of great information. Appreciate that, CEO Tom and, and Director Calabria. Thank you very much. Um, as we wrap Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. As we wrap up, I do want to touch on a couple of uh, pieces here. This is our NARO 2020 legislative and regulatory agenda. It is um, available to all, everyone now. It is on the NARO website at naro.org slash 2020 agenda. Also, it is in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar. Just click on the arrow next to handouts. You'll see a PDF there. You can click on it and download it immediately to your device. Uh, so this covers um, the NARO priorities for, uh, for this year. It also goes through the NARO programs, um, the, the HUD programs that NARO has uh, suggestions on and uh, will be advocating for in working uh, with Congress and HUD on. It also includes the NARO's uh, funding recommendations uh, for fiscal year 2021. So lots of great information there. Uh, please go out and grab that. One other piece I want to mention, uh, NARO does have a coronavirus website as well. Uh, is a collection of information from uh, both NARO and the, the federal agencies in Congress at naro.org slash coronavirus. All of that can be found again on the NARO website. You can see it all there at naro.org. With that, I do want to thank again our sponsor, Yardi, where again, this wouldn't have been possible without their support. Um, I want to thank everyone. Again, I'm George Ivano, and I do appreciate everyone attending today and all our panelists and speakers. Thanks again, and have a great day. Bye-bye.